Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Kate Campbell, always a pleasure to have you with me. Welcome back. Great to be back, Owen. We have a very special guest with us today, a guest, an expert guest who has been with us a few times. I know she's appeared on your podcast, How To Money. She's had a recent chat with me on the Australian Investors Podcast. And here she is again to share some more of her wisdom. She's got plenty left in the tank, including in the new book, Shareplicity. Um, there are two Shareplicity books. If you want to invest in international markets, which is the topic of today's conversation, pick up the second book. We'll provide links in the show notes. Danielle Ekie, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you, Owen and Kate. And uh, it's great to be here. It's always a pleasure because I think when we chat to you, you do a great job of making it practical, making it relevant and making it exciting to invest. So um, I know you're going, to, you're going to have some kind of examples for us throughout this conversation, but maybe if we dive straight into it, Kate. Yeah, absolutely. And Danny, it's, it's great to get your wisdom onto the show. And where I wanted to start was that since you've had such a wide ranging experience investing in Australia and overseas, a lot of our listeners haven't experienced, maybe March last year was the only experience of a market crash. And so many people have started investing post that point. And so there's a lot of people listening to the podcast that have never experienced much market volatility or a significant crash. And I'd love to hear a bit about your experience, the very first market crash you ever experienced, and maybe in contrast to how you went through March last year and how you'd approach a future market crash with everything that you know now, and maybe some of the things that we can learn from that. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, a bit, bit, bit scary, all that wisdom I meant to have, so hopefully <laughs> I live up to it. <laughs> Um, first crash, really simple. I just started in stockbroking uh, in 1986, and it was obviously the 1987 crash. And I used to flick on my tiny television every morning, and Michael Pascoe would be on talking about the US stock markets, and lo and behold, uh, the S&P or whatever was down 25%. And the response was very much got to the office, great boss, he goes, uh, lads and lasses, lad, lad, lads and ladettes, let's not stress out, this is not the end of the world, uh, we are going to do some buying today. So basically, that was the disposition in the research team where I was, we sat physically calculating PEs as share prices fell. So someone would yell out, Boral, whatever, what's the PE? Oh, that's looking really cheap. Oh, I guess it's more of a buy now. So it, it was one of the cases where the world was meant to end. We were meant to get a depression, but Alan Greenspan came in and this was the first example of where the central bank, the Federal Reserve, moved in to uh, drop interest rates to boost liquidity into the markets. Um, really, I think probably one of the most important crashes I've ever lived through is long-term capital management, which um, was a hedge fund, very, very famous in 1998. And LTCM was really important because it was renowned as being an expert in options and derivatives. They had two Nobel Prize winning people who create, uh, created the, the, the Merton and Scholes um, options pricing model on their board. And they were a hedge fund that had come and made themselves like one of the top performers, okay, for hedge funds. And they'd been around for about four years. And this black box of trading that they had created was meant to be infallible. And what happened was, is that you had the Asian currency crisis in 1997. And I'm going to get round to this point again, when we discuss some of the other um, international markets, because it's really important that people understand that uh, the, the peg to the US dollar for emerging markets actually broke, and they all had high levels of US dollar denominated debt. So as their currencies collapsed, they couldn't service 
the debt and you had this massive rolling contagion effect across Asia that started in Thailand and ultimately that moved around to Russia and Russia defaulted on its sovereign debt and LTCM, this hedge fund, was very highly leveraged and lo and behold they had said Russia will never default on its debt. They started to go under, and at the time I was sitting with a um, doing global emerging markets with a guy called Tim Love, who was the global emerging market strategist for Societe Generale, and he introduced this concept of systemic risk to me. Okay, and this is something that has come around recently with the Evergrande example in China. And why I want to point it out was up until that point, you really hadn't had a too big to fail example in financial markets. But 1998 was probably a pivotal moment where again, Greenspan had to come in, put a lot of liquidity into the system. You had all the other major banks in America having to bail out LTCM. And it really set the precedent, which what became the big 2008 crash and ultimately what we're seeing recently. And I guess the point of what I want to make about March 2020 was that it was quite an unusual crash. It was very quick. It was very severe. And what it, it showed yet again was kind of the fragility in the financial systems because of all the leverage. So in March, beginning of April, the Fed started to see that the markets became dysfunctional, okay, particularly in the high corporate debt yield markets. So you couldn't facilitate trades. And this, again, is due to hedge funds, all the positions, all the liquidity. They have redemptions. They then have to sell. If you can't sell, the market gets dysfunctional and equities get dumped. So it becomes a rolling sell-off. So what happens is in those markets, it is quite scary. But ultimately, the Fed came in, dropped interest rates aggressively, but also came in and bought junk debt and bought mortgage-backed securities. Uh, for me, how I manage my money in that situation, I do get a bit nervous because I'm older and there is some capital protection. So what I tend to do is that I, I did take some money off the market in the beginning. Once the market stabilised, once the Fed had stabilised it, I went back in and bought uh, reasonably aggressively. So I hope that kind of gives a synopsis of kind of where we are with crashes and the financialization, <clears throat> as I like to call it, of markets at this point in time. Can I ask a question just to double click on something there? You mentioned this idea of systemic risk. Can mm -hmm. you just explain for listeners that don't know what that means, can you explain what systemic risk is? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so it means... Um, I have, a, I have a, a, um, a chart that I can show later on, but once upon a time, we were all ring fest at Fangst, okay? And I'm going to give the example of mortgage lending here in Australia, okay? So <clears throat> the banks, they lend to you and me. We have a mortgage. Then we, in turn, pay off that mortgage, but that mortgage product is then repackaged as mortgage-backed securities, OK, and they're one of the biggest um, corporate bonds or, um, yeah, co that can be bought here in Australia. So if you go in and you happen to buy not only equities, but you buy corporate bonds, which I have done in the past, you are given um, a lot of options to buy mortgage backed securities from not only the banks, but also Liberty, Pepper, all those other providers. Also, as an investor, you can buy Commonwealth shares, NAB shares, etc. Okay, so what I'm drawing is the triangle here of the exposure to the property market. So if you get a property market crash or a company that is in trouble, like Evergrande in China, it means that the tentacles of the wealth effect go out. It's almost like it's, um, it's um, not accelerated, it's multiplied. And this is the problem. There's been so many financial products that come off of one single loan. Let's say that can be amplified five times. And because all of us have an exposure to that asset, it means that the world now 
when you have um, a lot of debt in the system and when it's amplified out into the community in terms of our wealth, when the system starts to shake, it becomes a systemic problem. So it's not just isolated to a bank. It means that you and I and the super funds and everyone else is exposed. And the classic case in point was when you had, um, first of all, you had uh, Bear Stones went down. And one of the reasons supposedly they didn't save it in the GFC is that they refused to bail out LTCM some 10 years earlier. But when Lehman's went, everybody started to panic because they owned a lot of those collateral debt obligations, those mortgage-backed securities in the US, which had been on sold, resold five times. And to understand that, it's worth watching the big short again. And then the whole banking system, people started to panic and felt their deposits were at risk. So you had potentially a run on the banks. Now, this is an extreme example, but in the case of um, Evergrande in China, where people have been jumping up and down, is that because the Chinese economy has 30% uh, of its GDP is related to property and everything's highly leveraged with a whole lot of shadow loans. So it's very hard to ring fence just one problem. Now in China, they will ring fence it because uh, Xi Jinping does not want the whole system to go down and he wants to protect the wealth of the people because 40% of the wealth is held in property. So hopefully it's the, it's the interconnectedness now of how much financial assets we own and how, how much uh, of our economy is related to finance, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, and I think a lot of people, especially people that don't really understand how debt works um, in particular, because they think about the stock market as a cause of a lot of issues, but they don't, necessarily understand that there's this underneath the surface of the stock market there's a debt market oh. which is where things like bonds are and that is far and away massive compared yep. to the actual stock market yeah and so that's typically where the party ends um underneath the surface um so that's really fascinating we've never covered that on, on the show so thank you for kind of being a field guide there one of the things that um, i'm hoping to switch gears to is something a little bit more optimistic danny which is basically you know, in Australia, we have this problem with home bias, which is we love to invest in ASX shares or ETFs, but even Australian property, but few of us um, actually want to invest overseas or actually go and do that. We, we, we think we want to buy, you know, Nike, Tesla, Apple shares and all that, but we don't actually go and do it. So I guess there's two questions in this. One is like, why should people go and explore these opportunities overseas? And I guess the other one is, can't, can't we just build a portfolio just here on the ASX or here in Australia? Like what, what's wrong with that kind of idea? Um, there's nothing wrong. And it's all about risk management at the end of the day. And it also depends on how much money you are actually saving and growing for. But I think the example that I just gave about the property sector in Australia is really important. And I just got some statistics that I thought we could just quickly run through. So in the ASX, and people may or may know, not know this, if you break down by sectors, financials are 30%, materials, so the iron ore producers 19, uh, healthcare is 11, and infotech is 4. If we look at the S&P 500, okay, it's complete reverse. You've got infotech at 28%, waiting, healthcare 13, similar, uh, financials 11 less than a third or about a third, and materials 2.6 doesn't even count, okay? I'm just going to quickly give you the returns on those markets over the last 10 years because, again, I'm trying to frame a picture for your listeners. So on the ASX 200, um, everybody knows that uh, dividend payments are really important. They're almost half of the return of your Australian share portfolio. For the typical investors that have made the most out of the high-yielding um, banks, uh, material sector recently, uh, also Telstra. So the total return out of the ASX 200 over 10 years has been 10.9%, whereas the price return is 6.4. So that shows you how important the dividends and the franking has been. When we look at the US, really interesting. So complete reverse, because obviously the big fang stocks have been the major performance. But if you look at the price return over 10 years, more than double, 14.2% from the S&P 500, and the total return, 166 So you do get dividend income even out of technology shares and the S&P. So why I think it's important for investors to consider 
um, when they are investing. And you don't necessarily have to go overseas to get that exposure because ETF products now in Australia are providing much better diversification to global stocks or to the US market and to themes. But the point is, is that when experts manage their portfolios, they don't basically have too much exposure to one sector or to one country. So your super funds would be investing across a spectrum of assets. So they would not only hold Australian shares, they would hold infrastructure assets. And you've seen so many examples of how much demand there is for Australian infrastructure assets. So unfortunately, every time a super fund or private equity fund goes and buys them, the retail investor like you and I are actually now not able to buy that asset. But they also invest overseas. And I think the point is, it's not like you have to, but why wouldn't you want to be part of some of the biggest, most amazing, best companies in the world that are going to be able to grow outside of the natural business cycles? And that's the bottom line. It's about diversifying your exposure to those companies um, that you know, that you use. And people say to me, but isn't the US really risky? And you go, well, I don't know. If you can buy cryptocurrencies, which are unregulated, have no transparency, have potential for high levels of regulation, yet you say you can't buy something uh, like an Apple, which has a market cap that is greater than many countries' GDP and more cash than you can poke a stick at, and is going to continue to grow and will not go under. And if the US is in problem, then the whole world is in problems. I think the problem is, is many people in their own countries get natural bias. And I guess I just wanted to open people up to how wonderful the investing opportunities are, particularly into the US. I'm not so bullish about other countries around the world, but we'll get to that. Um, but it just, to me, it's like, if you're young and you have the opportunity, why wouldn't you put some money there? Yeah, it's, a, it's amazing when you start to look beyond, beyond our borders. And Australia is such a small part of the, the overall financial market. But yeah, as you said, we, we sometimes get a bit scared about leaving our country and we think that other countries are inherently riskier when it's, it's almost a risk not to invest in a, a broader array of companies and because we get really focused on our large dividend paying companies in mm. Australia. Yeah, and, and there is a risk with that because they've underinvested over the years. And you're seeing that the banks are being fundamentally challenged by fintechs. And I think you can continue to assume that that is going to happen. Our banks are very exposed to property. And that's a phenomenon that's across the world. It's not peculiar to Australia. But I guess it's a thing like you can go and buy smaller cap stocks in Australia that might give you some exposure to some of these uh, secular themes. But by definition, because they're smaller, newer, uh, they're typically higher risk. And that's the thing. If you can buy a great company that gives you exposure um, to, to the cloud or to cybersecurity, but it's been around a lot longer and it's got a proven track record, to me, that is a better risk-adjusted risk um, assessment than buying a small cap that might do well for a couple of years, but then might have lots of problems. Mm. And you talk a lot about in, in Shareplicity 2, um, which is an excellent book, and I'd encourage our listeners to check it out, about different lessons that people can learn about investing in international markets. And I'd love if you could share some of those with, with our listeners and maybe um, some examples or strategies to illustrate each point. Yeah, um, it's really, really good um, question because you often hear everybody saying oh it's time to buy Europe so cheap or Japan Japan's coming back and you know there's going to be a new government and they're going to start spending and Japan's the place to go and oh but China of course we have to buy China because it's the biggest growth engine in the world um two points is I do have some charts um, that I can actually show on this but the first point I wanted to make when we did global emerging markets it's really important to understand that 
no single investor can possibly stock pick across the globe, okay? So I am never, ever advocating you as an individual investor should say, I'm going to buy that company there, that company there, that company there. It is like, that's way too hard. Even if you look at the likes of Magellan and um, Charlie Aitken that try and do that, it's a higher risk strategy to selectively pick, you know, 10 companies from around the world. So how we used to do it, doing global emerging market strategy, you, the way I would approach it, you either do it from a macro point of view, so you take a top-down approach, and in emerging markets, it's always like GDP is growing so rapidly, and they've got an emerging middle class, and it's going to um, grow a lot faster than the mature economies, therefore you invest there. Alternatively, and this is my preferred, is you look at sectors and themes. And sectors and themes are a much easier way to ride a growth wave. So I would say to people, don't try and stock pick globally. I don't have an issue with stock picking in the US if you are so inclined, but I wouldn't say start going off and trying to pick uh, just buying Taiwan semiconductors over in Taiwan and then you buy, you know, Toyota in Japan and or SoftBank or something like that. I just think that's a recipe for giving yourself a, a nervous breakdown. <laughs> but if you do want to look at themes, I think that's a great idea. And um, that is something that we will come to and the book discusses a lot. But I'll just quickly show a couple of charts, if you don't mind. Um, in terms of is my little... For anyone that's uh, listening to this, Danny, you sharing your screen? Yeah, um, I just wanted to... Uh, oh, I'm PowerPoint to... slide too. It's got it going on. Yeah, no, I just wanted to go back. Um, okay, so... Here's, this is from BCA, um, and um, I was very privileged to actually be able to see this presentation. Um, <clears throat> but basically, for those that are listening, people love to talk about emerging markets as being the place to put your money. I hear it so many times. Uh, I spent uh, eight years of my life broking emerging markets to major funds in the UK. And whilst I was lucky when I did it at a great time, the charts that are currently up are really interesting because they show that the economic growth does not necessarily translate into equity returns for the markets. And if you can visualize, it does um, the real GDP per capita for Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, versus the US, for example, and the GDP for China and Vietnam. These are all countries that everybody has, global emerging markets have invest investors have gone to. But you see if the chart goes more or less from left to right GDP growth happening, but then you look at the long-term share market performance, it's been dreadful. It's highly cyclical. It goes up and down. And basically, they have not one single, according to BCA, emerging market has outperformed the developed markets consistently over the last 40 years. So the reasons why are things like um, you don't have the transparency, you do not have the governance, um, you have major families that control a lot of these companies that are not only always working in the best interests of the stakeholders. But also, too, I think we've seen something of sovereign risk that started to emerge um, with what's going on in China. Now, I do know a lot of people and fund managers like to invest in China. Um, but I think for me, it is my, my investing experience there is just a disaster. I owned the ETF in the US KWEB, um, which is quite a well-known one, and it kind of doubled. And silly me thinking, oh, I should really sell that. Before I knew it, the <clears throat> Xi Jinping's cracking down on all the major companies and the thing halves overnight. And I'm like, oh, I'm probably going to sell it at the bottom. Sure enough, I sold it at the bottom, but I'm still not happy, unhappy with that decision because it's a bit like buying um, cyclical companies. You've really, really got to pick the upswing when the markets do rally because it's not like buying um, the S&P, which does go up and down. But if you were to look at the chart, it starts at the bottom on the left-hand side of the chart and steadily works upward to the right-hand side of the chart, which means you make money. Another example um, is just if Danny, we- Danny, yeah. can I ask a question just on this? Yeah, because sure. it looks like you've got basically two lines. One shows GDP 
um, which is the the growth of the country's economy, not like going up pretty strong. And then you have the stock market not going up nearly as strong. Yep. Is this why you're saying that you don't necessarily use this as kind of an indicator to help you invest? Is that why you're saying, and then you yep. prefer to focus on secular things yep. instead? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Cool. I think the reason why people buy um, the likes of emerging markets is because they have been, like China, one of the high growth engines of the world. Okay. That doesn't necessarily translate. Not into right. stock market performance. Probably a better way to have played that would have been buying Apple, Nike, Estee Lauder, uh, LVMH. You'll hear a lot of fund managers talking about, in my day, they'd buy Unilever, okay? So if you want to play um, the likes of the emerging markets, you can do it through multinationals because they sell into those countries, for example. Whereas if you were to go in and buy an Indonesian bank, um, you are taking a lot of risk on board, for example. That's not to say there aren't good good companies in emerging markets, there are, but inevitably you're taking on more sovereign risk, more political risk, uh, risk of um, obviously the pandemic has proved to be really, really problematic in emerging markets. Vietnam's had to close down all the manufacturing facilities and you're seeing supply chain problems for the likes of Nike. Um, so I think in terms of what I'm saying to people is that if you invest overseas, don't make it too complicated. It's not like you have to be in emerging markets. It's not like you have to be in Japan. It's not like you have to be in Europe. And there was just another case here of, um, this, this is just a chart. Um, I didn't do it again, it's BCA. And it's just basically shown that you've had really, really poor performance out of um, particularly European financials and Japanese financials, their banks. And um, a classic case in point of um, when you're listening to, we'll get to this when we discuss kind of things to learn um, when you invest, but we were told like Japan was going to be the growth engine of the world in the late 1980s and they were building golf courses and this, that, and the end. Of course, it spectacularly blew up. And we all know the story after that. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a company, it's a, excuse me, a country that has aging demographics. They've got big, you know, structural problems. Europe is similar. And why people say by Europe is because it's cheap. OK, it's cheap on a PER basis, but it doesn't necessarily mean you should go and buy it. And so I think that's really just what I was trying to um, show in, in these, that you have to be selective. And I'll get to where you are selective um, in a second. Now, what was the other question? Oh, where you can buy some examples of um international in, in Australia. Um, this is not a buy recommendation to everybody, but I just wanted to give a really good example. So there's an ETF called um, QUAL, and it's the Van Eck uh, Vectors MSCI World X Australia Quality ETF. And uh, that has a reasonably low expense ratio of 0.4%. It has a dividend yield of almost 1%. And funnily enough, if you look at the top 10 holdings in it, it captures a lot of those big US, what I call value growth stocks. So Microsoft, Apple, Alphabet and the like. So there is a case in point where you don't actually even have to go uh, buying US dollars, setting up a US dollar trading account, you can actually buy an ETF in Australia, which will give exposure to some of those secular themes that we might start to touch on. Yeah, that's, um, that's really interesting, because I think I saw a question come through from a listener the other day, and they were talking about the, the, the FANG, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, I'm probably going to forget the rest, that's um, right. uh, companies and whether they should actually because there were so few in there, should they buy each one of them individually or should they buy one of those ETFs that focuses on those major US companies? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think you need to know the companies quite well. Um, you know, for example, they're both, they've all got exposure. Okay, 
I'm not a big fan of Facebook personally. I don't own it. I don't really want to own it. Um, I don't really like the company and kind of what it stands for. Um, we're yet to see whether Zuckerberg's metaverse is going to take off. I think there are signs that the omniverse, which is kind of working, is, a, is, is, is an environment where you can work in a 3D capacity in a virtual world as a company. So architects are doing it, car designers are doing it, et cetera, and it's all done in the cloud. Um, when you look at the other ones, um, you, you, uh, you've obviously got Amazon, um, you could question how much more is going to come out of the retail side of the business, but AWS is a huge growth engine, okay, the cloud services businesses. Um, you've got a transition of the CEO there. So some people are saying, well, Bezos is gone. Is that the end of the company? Personally, I don't think so. But I think at the moment, going into the type of cycle that we are with potentially rising costs, um, due to the pandemic, supply constraints, higher energy costs, they might have um, possibly some issues around uh, whether their so sales slow down or whether there's pressure on margins. Microsoft and Alphabet, Google in particular, seem to come out as the two chicken dinner winners in this kind of sector, um, basically because Microsoft very much um, is geared into, it obviously has the SaaS revenues from its software business. It has an amazing cloud business, Azure, which competes heavily with AWS. Uh, but they also have their fingers in another, a whole lot of other pies. And it's perceived as more a value growth stock. So you're not buying an expensive um, software service like Atlassian by way of example, which is a lot more expensive and doesn't declare any profits. And then the Google story is very compelling because you've got a major search engine, you've got a huge growth hub in advertising, and you've also got the emergence of YouTube, which is proving to be an incredibly profitable advertising slash streaming service, which may come and compete with the likes of all the other streaming businesses, which are also held in the likes of Apple and also Amazon. So I guess the answer to the question is, um, it's, it's up to you. You can potentially uh, own them indirectly or an ETF will serve that purpose as well, but you will capture more of them. Can I switch gears again and just talk to you, Danny, about um, some of the mistakes that you've seen people make? And this may or may not be you know, specific to international markets. Just in general, um, what are people doing and what do you see kind of rhyme or repeat time and time again yeah i like to um i think i think the narratives um on the macroeconomic front overwhelm people um a lot and i've been really thinking about that a lot lately because investors are being hit left right and center with all these different stories are we going into stagflation is you know interest rates going up are we going back to the 1970s or how high are interest rates going to go and i think that's really really hard because fear is a powerful motivator to not do anything and to also sell at the wrong time and also to stay out of the market. And the more I think about this, um, the more I realize that a lot of the forecasts, A, can be wrong. Um, we didn't have the 20% contraction in GDP growth in Australia as a result of the pandemic, and the world didn't end after the GFC. And um, if the pandemic has showed me one thing, it's how resilient companies are, how much they can be dynamic, change and adapt and ditto with humans. And I think the lesson to be learned is be careful of the macroeconomic narratives. And you see it in the likes of fiat currencies are collapsing and you, you know, you have to only buy gold or you have to buy cryptocurrencies or whatever. Investing in shares is really, really about understanding your company and understanding their business model and what they are doing. And whether or not you're buying a company that's into a secular trend, or whether or not you're buying a company like an oil company that is geared into the, the movement in the oil price, which they can't control. And one example I wanted to give was that people forget, like everybody's like, bye-bye, the oil sector, oil's going to $100. Who knows? May not. 
you know, OPEC might decide to come out and say, well, actually, we're going to decide to lift production. And, you know, it's been the perfect storm, excuse the expression. Hurricanes have hit in New Mexico. You've got political interference in terms of the Russians and the pipelines and the gas in Europe. You've got stronger recovery as a result of the pandemic. But at the end of the day, as an oil company, you're dependent on how much you can extract the oil and the external price, which you can't control. Woodside's share price is the same as it was in 2004. And if you had bought it in 2009, around then, it was $74. Like, that's a really, like, that's, that's not a great investment by way of example. So I guess what I'm saying to people is really understand the company that you are buying and try and risk adjust it. Does the company have a history? Um, because... Does it have uh, good management? Because the other thing that investors tend to do is they look at the share prices and they take their view on how good a company is from the share price. And that's, again, a really, really big problem because if a share price is going up because momentum traders, because the chart looks good, it doesn't necessarily mean that the company is going to be around in two years' time and you're going to make a lot of money. So... I think the thing is, there's a lot of noise out there for investors. Um, there are people that um, like to be either mega bulls, perma bulls or perma bears. But if you're constructing a portfolio, I want people to really try and understand what they're buying unless they're buying an ETF, which is then a completely different kettle of fish because you're buying uh, an index, so you're buying the whole of the ASX 200, or you're buying NASDAQ, or you're buying like a secular thing, like decarbonisation, or cyber security. And that's a case of where you don't have to decide who the winners are and who the losers are. And just as one point, I think it's really important that when secular things, it's much easier to work out who the losing companies are going to be than who the winning companies are going to be. And uh, for example, I sold out of a lot of cyclical stocks ages ago. I think Owen, we discussed, um, and I could have as Kate as well, how I sold out of insurance stocks years ago. I sold out of Origin. I sold out of AGL. And a lot of those were made on my views on the secular themes of what was going to happen in the world. Now, whilst the, I mightn't have got the top of the market, the point is my money had been redeployed in other stocks that have done performed much better. Yeah. And if someone's sitting here right now and they're completely paralyzed by whatever the latest headline is, like there's already, there's been a lot just the week we're recording, but if you listen to it in 12 months time, there's going to be another big news story out there. What would you say, say to someone who's just completely paralyzed by the macroeconomic story and they just can't take any action? Yeah, that's really, really good because I know people that, um, have never invested post the G, they sold pre-GFC and they've never come back in again. I think we have to just take the view that it's not in any politician's interests or any um, central banker's interests to implode the whole world, basically. And um, you buy companies, for example, Alphabet, Google has 120 billion of cash on its balance sheet. So you buy companies that you know if the... If, if, if the proverbial hits the fan, they're not going to disappear overnight. They've got strong balance sheets, they've got resilient cash flow, and they are actually going to survive. And by way of example, a strategist said they saw the pandemic a bit like a war, and not because of, I'm not talking about the death and everything like that, but it's the level of disruption to the economy and the supply chains and all of those things. And we're seeing the really good companies make the most of this situation. It might be cutthroat, but they're taking over the weaker companies. They're expanding. They're making strategic acquisitions or they're investing somewhere else. So try and realise that there's always going to be these big headlines that are either really bullish or really bearish and the world's about to end. But unless interest rates are going a lot higher, which I highly, highly doubt it, really you're just going to be have an opportunity cost of not investing. And that's basically the bottom line. We all need to grow our earnings over time. And um, it's, it still is one of the easier ways than trying to save up for a deposit on a property, particularly when housing prices are as elevated as they are. 
Yeah, you're definitely experiencing that in Sydney right now. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly crazy. And one of the other things I love talking to you about is you, you're always really um, up to date with all the different global trends that are happening. And I think they're quite an exciting way and a, a good way for people who are sort of getting started with investing to explore some different areas. And I'd, I'd love to know a little bit about some of the global trends that you're really excited about over the next decade. And if investors are getting started and maybe potentially interested in investing in a thematic ETF how can they learn a bit more about these trends? Yeah, um, apart from my book. <laughs> Absolutely. That is a great resource um, to start with. I, I'm going to give an example, okay, and I'll, I'll state this categorically. This is not a buy recommendation to everybody, uh, but I am looking in a stock in the US that I kind of tripped over, and it's called MSCI. And, of course, MSCI is the company that constructs the indexes of which fund managers work on and I just gave the example of the VanEck ETF it's the MSCI Quality X Australia this company is very much uh, pushing itself in the direction of providing data analytics okay for the finance industry providing index construction across ESG and uh, climate change, decarbonisation. They're providing analytics for major fund managers, pension funds to analyse um, the emissions of companies. And why I wanted to cite this example, it's a wonderful example of a company that, in my opinion, has hooked into three massive secular trends. And anyone that's been following me knows I am a strong advocate and bull on global decarbonisation and addressing climate change. I think uh, you are seeing massive amounts of money continuing to move in this area. And what is a separate category now will become the norm in 10 years time. They are also huge on data analytics. Data analytics is very much part of what a lot of companies are doing at the moment, helping other companies interpret uh, data so they can market better to their clients, whether it's the consumers or other businesses. The third leg is that they are very much involved in uh, the likes of uh, fund management and ETF markets. So there are three secular trends that I'm, I'm very bullish on. That's a company that has an incredible growth record. It's performed very strongly. I'm hoping that it's going to come down more if we have more of a sell-off. And I think it's one of those companies that I talk about in the books. It's, a, it's, it's only $50 billion currently, which might sound big in Australia, but it's relatively not that big in the US. So looking at the seams, I think the largest one we have is clean energy, decarbonisation, electric vehicles. I'm sure your audience um, has probably been, you know, told all about, you know, Tesla, which is probably one of the shining lights in that area. There are ETFs that you can buy in that space. And you can also look at it in terms of trying to capture different aspects. So there's the materials that go into the production of clean energy products. So you're talking lithium in Australia. Uranium's had a recent run, although I'm not convinced that that's going to play such a big role. But then you also have over in the US, you've got a number of players um, in the hydrogen space um, and also in the likes of uh, photovoltaics, batteries, etc. I think that's a really big theme and you can look at it as um, holding like a lithium ETF or a clean energy ETF. <clears throat> the other ones that I really like, um, digitalization is still massive. Um, I think the likes of fintechs, digital wallets, absolutely massive and people will have the opportunity of potentially once Afterpay is overtaken by Square. I don't know how long those... Um, uh, deposits will be traded here in Australia for Square, but I think you're going to see continued growth in that area. The other major ones, healthcare is still massive. We've got some great healthcare companies in Australia. They tend to be a little bit more highly valued according to some commentators, but I think healthcare across the globe, particularly life sciences, is still a mega growth trend. Again, there are ETFs, ETFs in that area. And obviously the likes of cybersecurity is huge. 
as we move to, I think, more hybrid work models. And as much as everybody thinks we're going to return to normal, I don't think normal is something, this pandemic's going to be with us for a while yet. And I think that cloud security, cybersecurity, the cloud, improved software services, digitalization, um, really all of those trends. And if you want to capture them easily, that's why people gravitate towards the big tech, those mega giants, because they capture them very easily. I find that, pardon me, that um, example of MISCI or MSCI is a really interesting one. There are a few companies in that space that I've come across over my years, um, like Morningstar is an example, s and many of these companies that um, kind of, are investable standard and poor, like standard pauses s p moody's etc and as you know what it was really funny for me danny as you talked about um the market crash and all the lessons learned is that during the global financial crisis of 2008 2009 these were the same organizations that were really conflicted and yet here we are today they're still super important to the global financial system and there's like companies like msci have you know, even in the face of pretty much every type of scrutiny that you could think of, they've survived. So it's a really interesting company that you brought up and it's really relevant. So I just thought I'd just pull that one yeah. out because I, uh, they're not, I like uh, they're not a ratings agency though. Just, no, just remember, it, yeah, you're yeah. right. It is in that sector, but I actually think it's a very different company um, mm. because if you, 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 you're right, you're absolutely right. It is with S&P, it is with Moody's, et cetera. And um, I think that unfortunately, um, you know, obviously the ratings agencies got really heavily <laughs> compromised today, didn't they? Um, I just like the fact that these guys, a bit like BlackRock, um, who set up Aladdin, which is this software to help companies analyse ESG and rate companies. Mm. And because there's such pressure from pension funds and uh, investors to ensure that they're not going to get landed with a whole lot of stranded assets. They're all crying out for data that can really quickly scan and say, well, is BHP really doing what it's doing? And if it is doing what it's doing, what's its scope to emissions doing? And, mm. you know, are they walking? Yeah. So I guess that you're right. And But they're also companies that in spite of all these crises, as you said, they haven't disappeared and it's almost like you have to wipe out the whole financial sector to get rid of them. And that's basically not going to happen. So to me, they're ones that are, if you've got a rising interest rate environment, they've got an inverse correlation to that. They should not be affected. And one of the other the places that Owen and I often suggest that listeners go when they're getting interested in investing in specific companies is having a look on Twitter and potentially following a few people like yourself. And I mean, even we have an account on there in that space. And one of the, the things I wanted to talk to you about, because I know you're fairly active on Twitter and as a, as a female, there's not that many, especially Australian females in the investment space that are active and posting and sharing their thoughts. And there can often be a, sort of the, a, quite a downside for doing that. Uh, I'd love to hear a bit about like your approach to sharing your ideas online. And if any listeners are thinking about um, potentially going into the investment industry or sharing their ideas online, how can they get started there? Mm, really good question. Well, maybe stand back and observe a little bit. Gosh, I think if I look back at some of my earlier tweets, I must just look like the biggest numpty. <laughs> they were so basic. And even now I feel like I need to go to the school of social media marketing. <laughs> But look, I think at the end of the day that investing is very personal. There is no right or wrong. I think the hardest thing for people is confidence and belief in themselves and getting over the fear. And I always say there is never a question that is too silly because I learned ages ago, and I can't remember if I said to you, Kate, when I was an analyst, I'd go to meetings with these big CEOs or so, I might have been Owen actually, uh, on, you know, entrepreneurs, quote unquote, and they tell me all this stuff. And I'm sitting there going, I don't understand a word of what they're saying. So either they're super smart or I'm stupid. And I usually worked out if I didn't understand what they were saying, then something was awry. And I think people have to have the belief in themselves 
that, as I said to my son, he said, mummy, you don't understand, poor Nick, I always use him as an example, you don't understand Cardona, okay? And I'm like, oh, okay, I don't understand Cardona. You are missing the opportunity of a lifetime. And I said, that's fine. You've put me in the dinosaur bracket, but if you can't understand it to your poor mother, then you don't understand it as well. And I guess that's the point, like we all have to learn it's a process. No one comes out of the womb knowing about investing. It's a journey. And it's a journey that um, if you develop a passion for, I think it's fantastic because I'll give you an example. Because I follow markets and I follow businesses in renovating a house, we were very proactive about trying to short circuit the supply chain constraints. So we ordered everything for the house up front and early. And people said to me, well, why did you do that? And I said, well, because the pandemic is affecting things. So I guess for getting started, just observe, read. It is a process of learning along the way. And you can never be right all the time. That's just basically the bottom line. Investing is about finding what works for you and your risk tolerance and what you can sleep well at night with. Mm, that's that's certainly right. Like even, even the so-called world experts don't get it right all the time no. and they often have articles where they'll, they'll call out the next crash or the next X, Y, Z thing and then it'll a year later it will come out that, oh, they, they didn't get it right that time. <laughs> Absolutely. Jeremy Grantham is all over CNBC this morning. It's the biggest bubble we've ever seen, ever, 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 ever. And like, you know, maybe yes, maybe no. But if you own the right companies, they're the ones that will get through, even if there is an adjustment in valuations. Mm. It goes back to your point earlier on about um, not necessarily listening to like the story or the narrative. It's very kind of romantic to think that we have the opportunity and we're the ones that can um, listen to this expert and get an edge um, when it's just so often the case that it, none of that really matters if you're investing for like 10 or 20 years. Um, yeah, I, I, I got to admit that um, that the, the, the idea of just kind of lurking on Twitter or any of the social media platforms is really important and just kind of soaking it up. And I remember that you brought up how kind of, if it doesn't make sense, I, I think we spoke about that in the past. Um, I, 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 I got to admit, when I first started interacting with some of Australia's best investors, like as a, as a researcher, I'd go and interview them. I remember thinking, these, these guys and these gals, they're doing probably a worse job than I would do if I was doing that. Like I was, I was, I was just in awe of these people. And then I was thinking, geez, they must know something that I don't know. Like, what do they have that like a, it's like a, a black box or a crystal ball? And then you actually go and talk to them. And you're like, actually, hold on a second. This doesn't make any sense. Um, I'm just going to stick to what I'm doing. And, I, and I, it, it took firsthand exposure to see that, but I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, it's, it's so true. Someone supposedly sat down, a big investor, wanted a one-on-one -on -me one meeting, I think with someone who's on Twitter, I was told this story. And he said, okay, now I've got you in the room. Tell me the secret. And they go, what secret? <laughs> the secret of the stock market. And he goes, I hate to tell you, there isn't one. <laughs> <laughs> there's lots of there's lots of different avenues like you can have momentum trend charting analysis you can do your value investor and growth in I mean you name it there's tags all over the place but guess what there's no silver bullet here mm, yeah. <laughs> although ETFs I think are sold as that proposition that's mm. my humble opinion they're 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 packaged up as a wonderful low risk investment for people starting out. And I think that people need to understand ETF prices go up and down like the share markets. <laughs> mm, don't they all? That's all investments indeed. Um, there's one more question I have for you, Danny, which is basically, um, you know, we just talked about social media um, and how you can use that without kind of being, having an active profile. You can just kind of follow great people like yourself. Um, what are some other finance or investing resources that you think our listeners should um, take notice of. And obviously we're going to do a big plug for Shareplicity 2, but also Shareplicity 1. Um, if you're looking for a guide for investing in any types of shares, basically, you know, ASX and US shares, um, get Shareplicity and you'll quickly discover that there are so many things that you can do as an individual investor. So obviously I, I I think you're going to talk about Shareplicity a bit, but are there any other resources in addition to that? 
No, you gave a great plug. I think we'll just leave it leave it there. <laughs> I can show that. I'll, I'll just do my little plug. There are the books. Oh, there they are. <laughs> um, Very bright and colourful. They are bright and colourful. Uh, look, in Australia, uh, I have a my main source of um, looking at companies and uh, broker research is called FN Arena. And I find that a really valuable resource. I discovered that about five, six years ago. I had tried Morningstar not for me. I am on the ComSAC platform, so I do get access to Goldman Sachs research. I do read articles on LiveWire, but I'm fairly selective um, at this stage. I uh, have the AFR. Again, some articles I find really interesting, others that I don't. I do follow on Twitter. Um, really, in the US, it's a much, much bigger pond. Um, my primary sources, I have a subscription to Bloomberg, uh, CNBC, Pro, which gives me access to interviews, etc. I follow uh, for technology a lady called Beth Kindig, who I think is an absolutely um, wonderful explainer slash analyst for technology companies. And she has a free newsletter. So if you follow her on Twitter, I listen to Kathy Wood's macroeconomic more so than necessarily her company stuff, but I think. Some of her work is very interesting. Uh, I think that um, if you are interested in a company like Tesla, you can't go past Rob Mao, who does Tesla Daily, who is completely uh, approaches from a very transparent and independent fashion as opposed to a pump, pump and dump style. And I also uh, read an economist called Lynn Alden occasionally and for the really more big picture stuff, which I still like looking at. I look on uh, LinkedIn. I follow Victor Schwetz, who I worked with. He's one of the strategists at Macquarie Bank, who wrote a book called The, the Great Rupture last year. He's a mega thinker, a mega brain, um, but I find his work very interesting. It's actually quoted in Shareplicity too. And I also follow Mike Hal, who was my global strategist at Bearings. He was Salomon's before that. He runs cross-border capital and he looks at global liquidity analysis across the globe. So if people are looking for more Ray Dalio types of people, uh, that's where Mike Hal and Victor Schwetz uh, fit in. Um, some of their work is not behind paywalls. So I've tried to give people examples of stuff that's accessible. And I think if you um, are, again, receptive and listening a lot, and also bear in mind, there's nothing wrong with realising that understanding an overseas market like the US can give you insight into the Australian share market as well. Like, it's very obvious, like you watch the trends over there and they're replicated back here a lot of the time. So it's, it's again, if you have the time and the interest, I just encourage people to read, um, if you can pick up on any of the uh, research that comes out of Morgan Stanley. I love what they do I, I own the shares I think that they do amazing stuff but again it's progressive and it's into secular trends and things like I that I like and the only thing I'll say there is just beware of personal biases and confirmation bias mm, I think that's a great list and there's a lot of resources in there that we haven't heard before on the show so I think there'll be plenty to pack out the show notes with for people to investigate when they have a chance great excellent <laughs> Yeah, Danny, it's always a pleasure to chat to you. So um, we'll put all the links in the show notes to Share Plicity and Share Plicity 2. Um, you're on Twitter as well. So we'll put links to find you there. Uh, are you on, I can't remember, are you on Instagram? Yep. 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 Share Plicity. I'm on Facebook, Share Plicity, uh, LinkedIn, same moi, Daniela Couillet. And I have a website, shareplicity.com.au. So everything like your stuff will be uploaded there as well. And um, I try to put out a monthly newsletter. It's a little bit overdue at the moment, but, you know. <laughs> aren't, aren't we all overdue with something? Um, yeah, no, we really appreciate your time today to talk to us about you know, US investing, about the things to be mindful of, the key lessons from crashes. Um, you've even thrown in some ideas there to get us started on the ETF front with Qual. You talked about Miski, Tesla, digital wallets, healthcare, so many great things in this episode. So um, I know I'll have to go back and listen to it to kind of just let it all sink in. So thank you once again for joining Kate and I. And Kate, as always, it's a pleasure to, to be with you. Thanks, Owen. And thanks, Danny. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great fun.